Okay. Uh, uh, people are still joining, uh, but I'm going to uh, start. So first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone joining this webinar today. Uh, this webinar is the first of a series that we'll be holding this year, looking at different aspects of creating a mentor system and services that don't use coercive practices and that promote a rights-based and recovery approach. The purpose of this particular kickoff webinar is to present a picture of what zero coercion services can look like and to discuss how they operate and what it takes to develop them. Our other upcoming webinars um, throughout the year are going to drill down in more detail on the individual elements and the strategies and interventions described in today's webinar, which are required to eliminate coercive practices. These other webinars are gonna be very practical how-to webinars on a variety of topics, including crisis, de-escalation, recovery planning, supported decision-making, and many others. So please uh, refer to the chat for the full list of webinars. Uh, the webinar series is being run as part of the World Health Organization's Quality Rights Initiative, which aims to improve the quality of care provided by mental health and social services and to protect and promote the rights of people with mental health conditions, people with psychosocial disabilities, intellectual or cognitive disabilities. I encourage everyone participating here today to complete the WHO's Quality Rights e-training, which provides the foundation for establishing the right mindset and understanding to put in place these types of non-coercive services, strategies, interventions, and practices. So the link to this Quality Rights e-training is also in the chat. Uh, you'll find other practical resources in the chat on the overall Quality Rights Initiative, our good practice guidance on rights-based and person-centered services, uh, as well as information on the specific services featured today. In advance, I'd like to thank our moderator and uh, speakers for joining us and agreeing to participate today. Uh, we hope everyone's going to learn a lot from the discussion and dialogue. And now I'd like to hand over to Professor Javid Sukera, who will facilitate this webinar. Javid is a chair and chief of psychiatry at the Institute of Living at Hartford Hospital in Connecticut, the USA. He is also an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine and associate professor at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Javid is passionate about ensuring that mental health services are up upholding people's rights and provide comprehensive support tailored to their needs. He's also deeply committed to creating coercion-free services that enable people to have control over their mental health journey with dignity and autonomy. Over to you, Javid. Thank you so much. Michelle, thank you to you and your team for all the incredible work that you're doing. I truly believe that we are in a moment globally where I see a shifting of the tide. We know the harms that uh, are commonplace with the normalization of coercive care. And we know that um, the need to uphold a rights-based and dignity-centered approach to caring for, for individuals is, is clear. But the norm in many of our settings and contexts continues to be one of coercive practices in varying ways, shapes, and forms. In some senses formal, in some senses informal. Today, uh, as, as part of this first series, I think that we've got an amazing lineup. Um, part of my interest in this topic comes not only from some of my global experiences living and training in multiple countries, uh, including Canada, where I moved from a few years ago. Um, the, the case studies that we're going to hear today will give us example of not only how can we practically move some of this challenging work forward, but also how do we consider ourselves 
uh, part of this community of healers, of people who want to make change, knowing and recognizing that none of us uh, trying to do this in our settings were ever meant to do it alone. So our speakers today include Martin Zinkler, who's a psychiatrist and psychotherapist. He works as the head of department in a mental health services located in Bremen, Germany. The service provides inpatient, day hospital, community, outpatient, and home treatments. He's also co-editor and chief of the Journal of Law and Psychiatry for German-speaking countries. And since January 2023, he's a member of the United Nations Subcommission, Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture. We also have guests uh, from Canada. Kayola Baird is a peer support worker and community member. Kayola is a yoga instructor. Uh, a dragon boat enthusiast and believes strongly in the power of movement. She's worked as a peer support worker in supportive housing and as a finding recovery through exercise skills and hope worker, which is uh, shortened to fresh uh, at the Gerstein Crisis Center. Keola offers a direct understanding of the service user perspective, and she's accompanied by Susan Davis, who's the executive director of the Gerstein Crisis Center. The center is a 24-hour mental health and substance use crisis center in Toronto, Canada, which is my hometown. Uh, Susan has over 30 years of experience with many years in direct service as well as leadership. She's a leader in the development of innovative services, partnerships, and systems that improve access to the supports that people need and recognize the impact of social determinants of health on individuals' overall well-being. So a couple of housekeeping aspects. Um, we are in a webinar. We have lots of participants, which is fantastic, but it's a very important that individuals please keep their mics muted unless they are asked or have been called upon to speak. That helps us min minimize disruptions and distractions and really keep ourselves focused on the important discussion at hand. Um, once we finish with brief presentations from each of our uh, sites, we will spending most of our webinar in dialogue and discussion because it's through that discussion that we'll be able to get into some of the weeds but also some of the lessons learned. During that period um, we will have some facilitated questions if you would like to have or ask a question we will not be able to monitor all of those in the chat so we ask that you please use the raise hand function in Zoom um, that's done by going to the bottom or top of your screen going to reaction and raise hand and then we'll do our best to make sure everybody has a chance to contribute. So with that stated, we will uh, shift over to, to our first case and I'll invite Martin to take over. Oh, Michelle, I see your hand. Uh, yes, I think there's a battle with the captioning going on. So people are changing it to French, to Spanish, to English. Please, can we just leave it in English uh, for this webinar? Uh, so please, we'll, we'll set it to English. Please do not change it to Spanish or French or any other language. Over to you. All right, thank you. So we'll shift it over to Martin to get us started. Right, thank you very much, Shavid. Hi, everyone. There are plenty of uh, known faces, but much uh, many, many more unknown faces and names. So that's exciting. And I just share my screen here and I hope this will work. So, um, so if all goes well, you should see the road towards uh, zero coercion now. Um, and so can I get some indication that you see the first slide? Yes, we can see it, confirming. You can see it, thank you very much. Okay, so um, a short presentation, a few slides uh, uh, with a few photographs at the beginning for those who don't know the photographs. Uh, the left one, the blue horse is Marco Cavallo, the uh, symbol for deinstitutionalization in Trieste, Italy. In the middle, the blue camel, uh, the um, uh, symbol for the deinstitutionalization in Bremen. And on the right-hand side, this is the Heidenheim therapy dog. 
and by the name of Pontus, who made it on the title page of the 2020, 2021 uh, WHO guidance, with which you are, of course, all familiar. So that's our poster boy. And um, I start with a reference to Trieste because, I mean, probably most of you will say you need some references for the work that you do. You need some anchors, and this is mine. So the uh, Trieste or even the Gorizia uh, revolution. And this is not a quote by Basalia. This is a quote by Giovanni Yervis. Uh, Everything seems new, but nothing has changed. If the inmate does not become a subject again, if he has not given back his human dignity, if he does not gradually regain the right to speak and also the right to protest, if he does not have the possibility in real terms to make a series of decisions, then there's a danger that the restructuring of the insane asylum will continue to be a fiction and empty shell. And uh, on the photograph, you see Jarvis, the uh, one left from the microphone. You, of course, recognize Basalia, too, on the right from the microphone, and a few others uh, who joined the revolution at the time. Now, um, an overview of what I'm going to present to you. Um, the, I will present some of the tools that we used in Heidenheim towards zero coercion. We didn't land on the scenery zero coercion, which we will, you will see when I show some figures later on. But uh, there is clear there's a clear direction, and you may have wondered why is he introduced uh, uh, as a doctor who works in Bremen and, and talking about Heidenheim at. At the same time, and now uh, Bremen and Heidenheim are, some, Heidenheim are something like so 450 miles apart, and I moved jobs in 2019, uh, in 2021, from Heidenheim to uh, Bremen. So that's uh, the reason. Um, also, um, if you really want to end coercion in institutions or in hospital settings for that matter, uh, further changes will be necessary, and they are, of course, um, uh, described in the 2023 guidance of the UN and the WHO, and uh, Sebastian uh, and I so we published a paper in 2019 to give an idea how zero coercion mental health services could actually look like. So that's the so more visionary. But today we will uh, I will present what's possible in the current system, in the current German system. And um, I start with uh, a setting that is uh, conducive to that, which is uh, not a large institution, but a small uh, department in a general hospital in a district in southwestern Germany with a town and smaller towns and countryside and villages. And um, and uh, this uh, service has uh, 79 beds, but only 60% of them are occupied. Why that is, uh, we'll get back to later. And um, But the hospital does also uh, day hospital treatment, home treatment, outpatient treatment for acute admissions, for planned admissions, for transfers from medical wards, and also for involuntary admissions. So. This service provides statutory mental health services for a district of 135,000 population in southwest Germany, adults 18 and above, with no diagnostic restriction, and people with public, but also with private health insurance can get a service there. So that's tool one, a department in a general hospital is good. Next one is open doors. Um, all those wards, all those three wards have open doors between 8 in the morning and 8 p.m. And uh, that also includes uh, open doors for uh, patients who are involuntary because uh, Germany, as in most countries, has a mental health act, uh, so has legal provisions which allow persons to be detained in a hospital setting. Uh, that's also the case in Heidenheim, and yet doors are open. And for acute crisis, one-to-one -one support can be arranged with any member of staff. And so to make this 
doable the staff will take turns in providing one-to-one -one support. So one-to-one -one support is not just something for the nurses, it's something for the nurses, for the occupational therapists, for the doctors, for the consultants. So for everyone who uh, works there, then uh, it's something that actually can be done. The next one is uh, an intervention from the open dialogue. And um, so what we did is we uh, transformed traditional board rounds uh, towards uh, treatment meetings. What's the difference? The ward round starts with the question, how are you? The treatment meeting gathers uh, the network and the first question is, what would you like to discuss today? And that question is handed to everyone in the room and then uh, the replies to this question will then constitute the agenda of the meeting. The network of the service user takes part unless the service user objects and the meeting ends with an agreement on the time and place of the next meeting and the notes are distributed among the participants. Of course, of course much more could be said about the intervention, but we were instructed to keep the presentation short, so I will. Next intervention is supporting a legal capacity. I mentioned that um, people uh, detained under a mental health act are also admitted to uh, this uh, department and and so um, they are not free to leave uh, the place uh, but what we do is we support uh, people uh, in the process to appeal against the decision, which will then prompt a judicial hearing uh, within the next three days. And uh, we, uh, but we also support people for drafting advanced statements or even better joint crisis plans. So crisis plans, which are negotiated between uh, the hospital team, the outpatient team and the service user and their network. So how to deal with a future crisis in a way that uh, coercion and detention can be avoided. Next one is offering choice and providing options for acute cases in Heidenheim, inpatient day hospital treatment and home treatment are available without delay. So if you think, uh, yeah, that's how it should be, then uh, uh, unfortunately in many places in Germany and elsewhere uh, uh, for acute crisis, uh, uh, the road to hospital is the one you can go and all the other services have waiting lists and delays and you need to fix appointments to have uh, preparatory meetings and so uh, many services don't work for acuity and the transformation in Heidenheim was that for acute cases you have a choice between uh, uh, three acute uh, support settings in patient day hospital and home treatment. And home treatment and day hospital can be options to avoid involuntary inpatient treatment and Medication is an optional, but not a mandatory part of the treatment, even in cases of acute psychosis. And then the next one, removing financial incentives for inpatient treatment. So this is something that may be particular to the German system, but probably it works in similar ways in all those countries who have a Bismarck uh, health insurance system. Because what traditionally happens is that hospital services are the most expensive. But that also means that the, the, the health insurance pays more for hospital treatment than for other treatments. And so traditionally, health insurance pays more for inpatient treatment than for any other treatment setting. And then most mental health services with such a system then favor inpatient treatment because that uh, gets the money flowing in and you can pay uh, your staff and uh, you remain, uh, uh, profitability is probably too much, but you remain viable as a health uh, care provider. This, however, can be overcome with a regional mental health budget, uh, which is essentially a population-based payment system so where the incentive to uh, have beds occupied is removed. And Heidenheim has that since 2017 and actually managed to reduce the uh, uh, bed occupancy from 95% to 
Actually, I've seen that people from uh, uh, from Heidenheim are in our meeting, and they may be able uh, to uh, so uh, explain a little bit more how that has developed uh, over the last few years. Now, if you go on a road towards zero coercion, you obviously need you, you need indicators of progress, and here are some for inpatient setting. Detention in hospital in percentage of inpatient cases, but you can also uh, calculate it on a population basis. Some form of coercion in percent of inpatient cases and per population, and mechanical restraint, seclusion, and involuntary medication. And these are some figures, the one in the middle um, uh, are figures from Germany. So in German, Germany psychiatric hospitals, on average, 6% of uh, the patients are involuntary. So the other uh, 94 are uh, voluntary informal patients. On the population basis, you uh, um, get then a detention rate of uh, roughly 40 per 100,000 population. Then about similar number of those uh, persons who uh, experience some form of coercion during an inpatient uh, treatment, 6% of the uh, total number of cases and uh, 50 uh, persons per 100,000 population. Then uh, less so mechanical restraint, similar uh, um, uh, number for seclusion and a lower number for involuntary medication. Now. Um, some of the researchers in the area of coercion say, well, coercion is something that just goes along with the legal situation. It's part of mental health care provision, and there's not much you can do about it. And yet, uh, on the right side, these are the figures for Heidenheim from 2019. And uh, there is a different story to be told, because uh, uh, even as, uh, as cases per inpatient, uh, um, uh, per inpatient, it's not 6%, it's 0.9%, and on a population basis, it's also much lower. And the same goes for other forms of coercion, and, and so much so that in 2019, only two uh, persons actually received uh, medication against them, which is, of course, not zero and two too many. Yet, um, uh, you see how much the, um, the rates of coercion, the frequency of coercion is different to uh, uh, the German average. And the average means that there are also places uh, where the rate is even higher. There are actually also places in Germany where the rates are similarly and then in Heidenheim or, Heidenheim or even lower. So. I don't think uh, it's fair to say that uh, coercion is just something that you have to do and it goes along with mental health services. There is a road towards zero coercion, poor, perhaps not uh, zero in the current legal position, but uh, zero uh, towards zero. Uh, the, even in the current system, there's quite a lot you can do. And uh, that's actually what I wanted to present here. I hope I didn't... Uh, uh, go on for too long. Thank you very much. La Libertà e Therapeutica, the, so freedom is therapeutic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We'll shift over to our uh, guest from the Gerstein Center. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. And Martin, I really enjoyed reading your paper as well as your presentation. And it's exciting to see, even in the institutional setting, what can be done in that regard. Uh, Gerson Crisis Centre is a community-based mental health crisis centre. And uh, we were established in 1989 in Toronto. And that was really following um, a, a report that came out that was looking at the deinstitutionalization of psychiatric patients in the city at that time. And the conditions people were living in were extremely poor. And, and uh, I know this is probably typical, not just in Toronto, but other cities across the world and certainly across North America, where the resources had not really been shifted, even though the individuals were shifted into the community. And so people were left with very little um, to support them in their day to day and also really only had 
um, one place to go when things went wrong, and that was back to hospital. So um, Dr. Eva Gerstein, who is this, the founder of, of Gerstein Center, worked with another woman, Pat Capone, who was um, a person with lived experience and an activist at the at the time, but also a developing activist really at the time. And they they really joined forces in thinking about how how this could be different. What could we do um, that would allow people to be able to maintain as much autonomy over their well-being um, while at the same time recognizing that people may go into crisis and it may be for uh, very much symptomology but it may also be um, a, a range of issues that people face that that they do require support for that um, going back to hospital often made people feel like they lost any gains they had in the community and so a group formed and built an or our organization and it was really about creating an alternative a place that people could go uh, when they were in crisis, get support, um, be able to maintain, um, you know, dignity and respect. Some of the you know features that uh, Javid mentioned at the very beginning was so important was really creating an opportunity to um, work, uh, understanding people's strengths and um, and uh, making sure people had access to supports they needed when and where they needed it. So we are a 24 hour crisis response um, in the city of Toronto in Canada. And that includes a telephone crisis line. Uh, we do mobile team visits in the community. We offer short term residential crisis beds um, in, within the city and in, in a variety of settings, uh, largely in home like dignified, respectful spaces. And uh, we do follow up and support post crisis and referrals to needed health and social services. I just want to add there that's you know really important feature at Gerstein Center is that we have people with lived experiences centered in all the work that we do from our board of directors to our frontline staff, including in some of our recovery based programming, making sure that um, that at least it's, for instance, at least thirty percent of the board are people with lived experience, and oftentimes it's more than that. And the goal there really is to stay vigilantly sensitized to the communities that we're serving and to the needs that people are presenting with so that we don't lose track, that we do stay on track and, and also really center those voices in, in our work so that we are staying um, connected to the community and the community feels that Gerstein Center is, is part of them. It's such a key feature. For instance, in our house, and this is just an example, in, in our um you know, residential settings, we have, um, you know, people have full access to the kitchen, they have full access everywhere, basically in the house, we don't have a lot of barriers about where people can go, other than into the crisis room where they're answering crisis calls, the, the workers, and they have um, able to make themselves a snack, they're able to um, have a guest if that's, you know, visit visitor at that time. Um, you know, anything really, they can come and go, they can go back into the community, they can even go home and come back. It's really meant to be very free and, and as a place of support for them. And part of that, we have artwork that we've purchased from uh, from people with lived experience and gift it to us as well that's on the walls. And really, um, everything that we do at the centres is, is really to symbolize the strength and capacity of people living with mental health um, and substance use uh, concerns. So, um, you know, the services are, are really, um, you know, based in uh, consent based, equity focused, uh, and respect the dignity and autonomy and the expertise of the individual. And um, to, to give you some concrete examples about how that happens, of course, one is the involvement of people's lived experience throughout the service and making sure that people see that reflected there. That really helps us uh, to make sure that, um, you know, people, that, there, that there's very much uh, an understanding of where people are coming from. And um, in terms of, uh, you know, the expertise of the individual, our crisis response will stay focused on that individual and what they're presenting, allowing them to tell their story um, the way they see it and decide for themselves what it is that's going, going on. And, you know, part of that means that when, when they reach out for support around a crisis scenario, um, if, if it doesn't have to be at the worst moment for them, it may be the worst moment for them, and often it is, 
but also people could sort of make that decision for themselves that they need support in that moment. And that's going to be responded to. We're not going to decide, hey, now you don't really need it. And now you, it, oh, now you do. It really is um, trying to work with the individual and, and, and letting them identify for themselves when support is needed. And the benefit of that, well, there's many benefits to that, is that people can sometimes reach out earlier on in a crisis where they can get the support they need. And obviously options are far more uh, varied and available to them at that time. And um, the other part that uh, I think is really important is that we um, make sure that people are able to uh, make make decisions about what next steps are. We do crisis planning with everybody. The individual is very much a part of that um, and, and uh, has a say in, uh, of course, not just a say, but really drives what that crisis plan is going to look like. So recently, we've seen some expansion at Gerstein Centre as the City of Toronto has uh, taken a second pass 30, 30 years later to say, you know, we really don't want um, crisis services being delivered by police services. And I think we've seen around the world many reasons why that has come about. And uh, certainly the situation um, it, with George Floyd in, in the States and many um, other scenarios here in, in Toronto really brought on some activism again to say, look, this just can't be the way things are going. And so uh, Gerstein Centre also joins in that voice. And we have, we have now um, over three decades of delivering community-based services in the community without um, any kind of security or police associated with us. So we know that this can work. And uh, we're a really big part of helping to develop what what we now call the Toronto Community Crisis Service here in Toronto, that um, does center a model that's rooted in community, anchored in community organizations that have relationships with their communities and provide, uh, you know, um, really uh, harm reduction and uh, trauma-informed um, care um, to people in ways that um, allow it to happen wherever they are and um, and when they need it. So at Christian Centre, we really do believe strongly that a model in which the earliest intervention for mental health crisis is provided by a mental health worker rather than the police service. And for many reasons, including that this really does provide opportunities for better access for people to the mental health and social service needs that they, they may have. And also to leverage help sooner, you know, not wait, uh, which a lot of people do, just wait and wait because they're trying to avoid that um, coercion. They're trying to avoid um, having an interaction with the police, um, but 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 making it available and, and and easy access and low barrier allows people to have to leverage that help sooner sooner and reduce stigma and obviously coercive approaches to care and certainly big part of that is unnecessary police or criminal justice involvement. And we know there are communities that are more impacted by that um, in Canada, in particular, our Indigenous communities and Black communities are uh, finding that when they are presenting with mental health care, they are more likely to end up in our criminal justice system. They are um, overrepresented in our correctional facilities. And more recent report also, um, you know, illustrates that they are also more likely to um, be apprehended under our Mental Health Act. And so we know that that's uh, something that we really need to work um, to try and, and uh, change. And so when we're thinking about these kinds of approaches and reducing coercion in mental health care, it really is a paradigm shift that we have to commit to and really think differently and approach it in a very different way. So Gerson Crisis Centre had the exceptional experience of working with Human Rights Watch over the last few years, and together we developed a usable framework that we hope is usable anyways, um, that called uh, Mental Health Crisis Support Rooted in Community and, and Human Rights, and it really outlines our work in greater depth. I know that uh, the folks uh, at World Health Organization have shared this with um, people today, uh, and I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at it. Um, you know, we're really uh, interested in sharing the case study and, and really happy to be part of this conversation and, um, you know, excited for the conversation that will, will ensue um, because we really do want to see that we want to improve the experience and health outcomes of people experiencing mental health concerns and really um, make a difference in that world because it's very far overdue. And uh, we really want to make sure that holistic approaches to mental health crisis response that supports the autonomy, dignity, experience and expertise of individuals in crisis is centered in how we move forward. So I'll leave it at that and we can uh, 
move over on to the conversation side of things. And so thank you very much for hearing. And I, I, I wonder if Kayla was going to also comment on a little bit, so I'll let you do that now. I will try to keep this very succinct. But I'm Kayla. I have personally benefited from the support services at uh, Gerstein Crisis Center myself. And through that experience, uh, the support and the growth and the uh, ability to access the, the help that I needed at the time um, also led to my ability to contribute and then using my past experience and my skills to uh, contribute and be part of the, the very the very organization or, or system that 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 helped me so it's uh, just been a, a full circle I guess one can say yeah. thank you thank you so much to both of you and to you Martin so what what I'm going to do I'm going to start off with some tough questions and then we'll invite folks in the audience to start uh, raising their hands now both both examples, both case studies are incredible. Both are in different contexts. Both demonstrate, you know, tangible attempt to, to transform something within a system that there might have been a norm. So the, the first question for both, maybe we'll start with the folks in Toronto. What was the biggest source of resistance to the kind of non-coercive change that you were seeking to, to implement in your system? And how did you overcome it? And try to keep your answer a little bit succinct for me, because I know you could, we could all go on about it. But what's that biggest source of resistance? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that I can go back down, back to 1989, what we were, what we were experiencing at that time to actually establish Gerstein Crisis Center here in Toronto. And that was that people just didn't believe it was possible. They didn't think that it was going to be able to address the needs of people in the city. It, they didn't think they thought people would, uh, it would fall apart. People would get hurt, you know, uh, that it, it really wasn't possible. It was the really, um, you know, at, at, through the process of developing the center, we, uh, I know that they went through certain iterations, whether we should be connected to an, a, a hospital or whether we could exist independently in the community. And almost to the day of opening, that debate was still going on. And I think that, uh, you know, we actually do stand alone. And it's a really important uh, feature because I feel like, um, you know, you don't want to be, at, at this point, the way things exist right now, you know, uh, at the at the um, the helm of uh, an institution because you want to be able to do things differently. So we work collaboratively with people, but it it was it was really the sort of the resistance was very much one I think of stigma and and not knowing how this could happen. But what we have found, of course, is that that didn't happen. Everything we we are not good, very lucky. We have very strong safety record. We speak to over thirty thousand people every year on our crisis line, and we have thousands of people on our mobiles and thousands who come through our beds. And it has been extre extremely uh, beneficial to people. So we have gained some respect, I think, over those years. Um, but most recently, you know, with this push around non-police crisis response, and some of the barriers exist there too, is that we have very strong stigma about what happens when somebody's in crisis. There's a belief that people can't make decisions for themselves. There's a belief that they're dangerous or going to hurt somebody. And so that 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 kind of belief of, of what is going to do, of what, what's possible for people, really dominates. And, you know, it, it, we end up setting up uh, systems on those, those ends of the spectrum as opposed to what is the majority of the spectrum, which does not fit there at all. So those are, I think, are some of the barriers. Great. Uh, Martin, what about in, in your case? What would be the biggest source of resistance and how did you overcome it? Well, um, I called uh, Stefan Priebe here, who may be known to some of you, professor of social psychiatry, London. Uh, Stefan said to me, Martin, you know, uh, the world is not ready for coercion-free psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And I think he has a point. And uh, um, although I wouldn't agree with that, but the point is, and that's, uh, that's what we found in Heidenheim, and that's why uh, what we find in Bremen here, where I'm on the same quest, 
is that initially everyone says, oh, cool, okay, psychiatry, open doors, no coercion, that's great. But then at some point there will be uh, people in the media being concerned about uh, mm -hmm. uh, whether a psychiatry is still uh, fulfilling its role as an agent of social control, as a, an agent to mitigate uh, violence, uh, danger, risk in society. And, and then the media will sort of, uh, the, the local newspaper will run some story. And then uh, Germany has a traditional system of uh, support, uh, not supported, of substituted decision making, which is a traditional guardianship system. And then the guardians uh, came and said, oh, we are concerned about the people we are supposed to be responsible. So uh, legal guardians in Germany often feel responsible for their. Uh, 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 for their clients' uh, behavior and for their clients' welfare. And, and they say, okay, we cannot fulfill our role as the guardians if there is a, a too liberal, coercion-free system. And then uh, sometimes the police uh, uh, wonders uh, why they... Um, why they should bring someone to hospital if this person is uh, uh, out of hospital the next day. And, and so, so that all needs to be managed. And in a way, uh, as, a, as, the ser as an innovative service, we have the burden of proof. And the burden of proof is the, difficult to, to deliver because um, Extreme cases, extreme situations don't happen too often. And whenever something, whenever something happens, then this is the fault of uh, the coercion-free service. Yet, if over time you can, uh, uh, you can prove uh, that uh, numbers are getting better and people are ready to listen, then uh, there is hope. And for example, in, the, in Bremen, so that's the new service I've been now for three years, the numbers of people who were brought to hospital by the police have gone up for 25 years to a total of 250%. So these numbers would suggest that uh, in Bremen uh, in 2020, there were 250% more dangerous and mentally ill people uh -huh. on the street than 25 years before. And what actually happens after 2020 those numbers went down. And so I was, I was delighted to look at that because it was a significant decrease. Uh, so I mean, Bremen has uh, roughly 600,000 inhabitants and 1,450 times a year, the police intervenes in some situations and uh, either at person's home or in public space and brings the person to hospital. And, and so that has been going up for 20 years, but now it's going down. And so, and, and that in, the, in, a, in a way, um, I don't think the police has become, uh, but, um, what I think uh, is happening, that's at least my interpretation that our service has managed to be more um, uh, proactive and our crisis response services get to the uh, persons in crisis before the police does, just as Susan uh, mentioned before. So mm -hmm. I think these are these are ways to overcome this challenge, but uh, there are challenges. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to jump in on that, Martin, if I just could just react to that, because I think that really that you, you mentioned earlier in your earlier present part of the presentation about investment. And I think we have continued to see police budgets uh, continue to grow and, uh, you know, community mental health budgets not uh, grow at that rate. And so, you know, sometimes I think people think, well, that's that, that that's an indicator, because like you were saying, like, you know, 250 you know, times people have been brought in, um, you know, by police, they think, well, that's what is needed and what the problem is, but it's just where the investment's been made. When you do things differently, you can really impact that in, in very big ways, for instance, our first year of operation with the Toronto Community Crisis Service, we were able to divert um, well over 76% of the situations away from a police response. And on top of that, that was with um, a, 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 a piece of policy that they had when uh, uh, ambulance was on site, they had to have 
uh, police presence. So if we reduce that, we'd also even have a greater uh, diversion rate. So we know it, it can work, but it's where the investment is made. So part, part of that change then becomes working outside of one's traditional silo in the system, mm -hmm. right? The, the system itself needs to be part of what you need to do. Um, but there's also that sense of, you know, what can we do? How much is possible? What's even possible? So how have you, your systems found, or how have you found in your cases um, that work has gone in collaborating with other sectors, other partners, um, what's worked, what hasn't? And maybe Kayola, if you could start a little bit with what's worked on the service user side and, and what some of those ingredients are that you've noticed that are, are really essential to meaningful and um, uh, effective service user partnership. Uh, well, uh, on the on the user side of it, I think what uh, it just comes down to communication and and personal interaction. So uh, it's it's not terribly complicated. <laughs> it's not uh, it's not um, so difficult to understand. H having people in the community. Uh, that can meet with you, talk with you. Uh, it's easy to access. You can have conversation, um, and in a in a familiar setting. So, if you were, for example, like I did, call into the crisis line to uh, to have you know a couple of the workers come out and meet you at a place where you're both familiar, you're comfortable, you're close to home. Um, you sit and chat just as you would uh, a, a friend or um, maybe a family member, and that builds trust. It it also to you you know it, it, you can maintain your dignity in that you're 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 treated with with respect and like Susan said you're in charge, you can then communicate what you need. They can make suggestions and you work on a plan together. So it really is, it really is something, uh, I would say that that personal, that personal interaction um, and having it in the community, easy to access, that is, that's definitely key. I mean, a lot of our services have been developed with collaboration with partners. We're working across sectors. We're working within our sector. We, um, you know, don't have, our services don't exist in a vacuum in that way. So what we're doing by creating partnerships is improving that access and then connection to needed services post-crisis. And so we have a number of partners um, from community health centers uh, to uh, short-term psychotherapy providers uh, we've got uh, access to case management and housing. Um, not well. We have access to. There is no case management and housing. We don't have enough in our community, but we have uh, a, a direct access for that. We even have access to a program through the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Ravi, you're familiar with through their bridging program. That's direct. We can bypass their emergency room. So we're looking at ways to smooth. But through partnership, we really smooth the access and connection for folks. And then um, post all of that, even when we have referred people on, there's 90 days of follow up so that we can stay with the person and make sure that whatever happened worked out. And if not, look at alternative plans. So I think it's really trying to do that whole care, you know, surrounding the individual at the time that they need it and making sure they can access what they need to, to, to be to, for whatever that looks like for them in terms of next steps. Yeah, and, and Martin, what's worked and not worked in terms of cross-sectoral partnerships for you? Um, well, what uh, what worked is uh, the collaboration with the uh, with the police. I mean, that's an example now for Bremen, but this, uh, examples are exchangeable. The situation wherever you uh, um, uh, transform services, uh, you need to. Uh, 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 engage the police and uh, here in Bremen we just uh, last year we may uh, we organized a joint conference we have regular interface meetings 
informal and formal, but also uh, uh, organized a joint conference and uh, presenters from both uh, uh, departments, mental health and police. And, and that uh, many of, uh, after the conference, you, you think you haven't heard my, uh, uh, that much news. You have heard it all before. But actually, uh, then if you look at the cooperation, then in the following months, you see, OK, there's better understanding between the different agencies. So uh, it's so meeting with the police or with the magistrates or with the guardians uh, and with the press um it's just i don't i think it's the only way uh, uh to uh, overcome these challenges uh because it's uh, you, you you have to constantly explain yourself again and again and again you mustn't get tired of that and and but uh, so uh, police uh, works guardian uh, uh, guardians uh, and guardianship procedures and the whole guardian system is much criticized in Germany for exactly uh, uh, not going along with the changes towards the convention, William preferences and all that. And so they're, they're a tough bunch uh, to work on, uh, I may say here. Yeah, so I'm going to invite folks to start thinking about their questions and feel free to start raising their hands. Something that I noticed in both of your case studies and presentations is a tension that we're feeling as well at the Institute of Living in Connecticut. And the tension is between what I would frame as credibility and vulnerability. Yeah. So what do I mean by that? Well, both of you described, so first, you know, in the Kirstein case, it, it was not possible the audacity of something that feels so impossible. So what's the narrative? How do you tell the story? How do you aspire for something that might not even be possible today or tomorrow, but it's possible in a generation? And then in um, in Germany, you said, Martin, about, it's almost like we have both the burden of proof and the burden of blame. So that's where the credibility part comes in, right? That you know we have to prove something about what we're trying to do Within, within the context of systems and societies that are looking for data, that are looking for facts. And then we also have the burden of the blame. So if there's something that happens, it's instantly because we're trying to not do something that's normal. So I think that's something we're grappling with a, a lot as we're trying to bring in a rights-based approach in an American context where um, people think in a dichotomized way, like, well, if you're going to be doing something that increases rights and dignity for the the user of the service that somehow decreases the rights and dignity of the, the worker or the system. And that zero sum framing, and I, I tell people all the time, you know, dignity is not a pie. If we give dignity, we actually give and elevate ourselves and our own dignity as well. So that tension between credibility and vulnerability is something, you know, I'd encourage people to chew on, again, invite hands and questions, but maybe I'll ask you you to reflect on that and tell me a little bit about how you've navigated that tension. How can you build a case of credible change, but also be humble uh, and open about um, some of the stumbles along the way? Well, it's just interesting. The one thing that popped into my head and is is the idea about you know the vulnerability of when when the system's not speaking to each other and we're not we're looking at data in vacuums you know where you look just at your data and not at the data of any other provider and they're not speaking to each other and we've got a long way to go um in terms of you know we're looking at data across our entire system to to really understand things a whole lot better from that point of view um, and it's funny for me about people to talk about data because it isn't, uh, you know, the focus exactly of our work, but it has become really important to be able to um, actually uh, do that kind of measurement to show some of what the, the facts are. For instance, in Toronto, Toronto Police Service did um, do a review. You know, we've been saying that people are over-policed. We've been saying that uh, Black and Indigenous folks are more likely to be arrested and apprehended and, you know, uh, you know, the sort of mixed, you know, of ideas about whether that was true or not. But when they actually did look at the data, that is what the data proved. It did come, it did, it did come out. So I think that, um, you know, being able to tell the story is, is difficult to do 
just at one part of the system without looking at the whole system. And so that can be really powerful in terms of telling a more complete story as opposed to, you know, Martin's program's just not working because it's this and because there's so many other factors at play. Um, so that's one thing that popped to my mind. I've, I've got others, but I'll let Martin go next. Sorry, can you uh, repeat the question? I had some technical problems. Yeah, sure. So Sorry. how did you navigate the tension between needing to be credible and proving that what you're doing is effective while accepting that that's hard to do sometimes and there are things that and interventions you might do that not, might not immediately produce the kinds of results that folks are looking for? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, the one thing is uh, uh, what you're, what we are doing in Bremen. Uh, so, of course, we are sitting with everyone at the table and uh, discussing things. But at the same time, we actually do transformations. So we close uh, inpatient wards and start uh, a home treatment team. So, which is a transformation uh, or a shift of personnel from inpatient to community and outreach services. And Germany doesn't have community treatment orders, so uh, that means uh, if you close down an inpatient ward and you have less beds uh, and uh, less places to uh, do coercion, and uh, you have more spaces where coercion is not an option, which is in home treatment, so uh, or assertive outreach, so it's a similar concept. And, um, and so you actually uh, prove the point by doing it. And that means you just have to win some time uh, in the transformation. And then after a couple of years, you can say, OK, we have, a, we have that, that many uh, uh, hospital treatments less and that many home treatments more. And at the same time, the number of police interventions with, the, uh, with so-called mentally ill people uh, is going down. And that's when you can start uh, uh, proving a point. But uh, it, it, uh, um, the proof is always behind uh, uh, the the action, to put it that way. Yeah, so that's, I love that. You need to just do it, right? You prove prove it works by doing it, and not getting too wrapped up in all the other sort of forms of resistance. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, the second round of us, uh, you know, the, the most recent changes in investment in Toronto, in the, with the Toronto Community Crisis Service, we had three decades of, of delivering services in this way that really made that um, a whole lot more, um, you know, respected um, in, in this particular round than when we started where there hadn't been anything like that before. So it, it does does bear out. I think the burden is often on the community, though. I think you know the institutions they you know talk about change, but aren't making the commitments necessarily in the same way, um, and making sure that um, you know we have to hold, hold to account. And I think that's part of what I was getting at with the data, like you know making sure we're looking at that everywhere uh, across the system and really advocating for change, not just us doing something different, but but overall, how do we change the way we approach uh, mental health across many institutions? Yeah, so I, I'm not seeing hands. I think people are trying to ask in the chat. I'm going to encourage people to not be shy and to raise their hands if they can, uh, so that we, we have that real dialogic form of, of engagement. But I'm going to ask something a little bit provocative. Um, do you think that what you're doing is possible if there isn't another element of the system that's engaging in coercion? So what do I mean by that? So a community-based service, is that only possible if there's still a hospital that might be admitting people involuntarily or uh, having a hospital with open doors and, and unlocked wards? Is that only possible? If there are other settings that uh, that that actually are more coercive, how do people feel about that? Because we want an entire system without it, not just bits and pieces. Any thoughts? And I would. I'm happy to uh, share some thoughts about it. And I mean, that's why. 
that's why I constantly uh, uh, keep uh, reminding of the Trieste example, which is a whole system approach. And that's obviously something that we want you to emulate in Heidenheim. And in Heidenheim, there is no other uh, institution or setting which would uh, be able or be destined to provide coercive care. So uh, uh, while it's not a whole system approach in Heidenheim, because there's so, so certain problems in the German health system, uh, separation between uh, uh, community uh, and doctors and hospital, yet uh, as far as the more severe end of crisis is concerned, Heidenheim is a whole system approach and Bremen is as well. Bremen is even far further, uh, um, further in that way because it included uh, the people traditionally employed by the uh, uh, social uh, services included in the mental health services. So, um, so there are the parts of our budget come from health, parts of our budget from mm -hmm. And so, um, so of course, that's something that uh, you need to be mindful that uh, your change is towards less coercion. Don't go along with more coercion in different parts. But that's actually what we, what we are aiming at in uh, both services, and that's uh, what Trieste has achieved. And then, uh, I mean, you need to, you need to build alliances, and uh, the alliances are. Are pretty obvious. One alliance is to use a movement, and the next alliance is progressive people from law, uh, human rights uh, people. But then, of course, with the international organizations like WHO and the UN who have uh, joined forces in that respect. So uh, there is the movement, as you said, and we just need to get the movement uh, uh, some, give it some traction on a local and community level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a hand. So let's go to Renato Oliveira. Hi, colleagues. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Renato Oliveira, the unit chief for mental health and substance use at the office of WHO for the Americas in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for the fascinating experiences that you guys have, have uh, shared uh, with us. It, it becomes very clear and it's also based on our experience that the countries were able to better advance on the reduction of coercive practices. They, they, they really uh, give ownership of the treatment process to people with mental health conditions. They also create options of services and options mm -hmm. of activities for people to uh, be able to uh, have uh, uh, processes that where they are engaged with the staff, with the services, and, uh, and they can exercise their, their treatment plan. One of the challenges that we face, and, and the idea here is to bring the discussion to the reality of uh, low and middle income countries, is uh, staff. Staff, not only in terms of skills, but also in terms of numbers. Could you guys share with us uh, your experiences in terms of uh, what could be a staff uh, patient ratio, let's say, in wards for people with severe mental health conditions or in community services that address needs of uh, people with severe mental health conditions? Because these are questions that we that we that we always uh, uh, have to address. What is the minimum? How can we have services that can uh, guarantee safety and provide the quality care? So if, if you could also share that with us, I think it can be very helpful for, for, for countries that want to advance and engage in those processes. And thank you again so much for, for sharing your experiences. Thanks. So who wants to take that question about staff, staffing? Uh, what, what are those numbers and how do we ensure the adequacy of resources? Well, uh, from a German perspective, uh, uh, most people would probably agree that the resources uh, in the system are sufficient. They're just not used very well in terms of human rights and avoiding coercion. So what we uh, offered uh, the health insurance companies in Heidenheim and in Bremen, we said, uh, we don't want more money from, we want the same money, but we want the freedom to move staff from inpatient to community work. 
and they they got on board with that. And uh, so, um, if I remember correctly, in Heidenheim, I think we had about a hundred whole time equivalents of uh, uh, doctors, nurses, psychologists, and uh, and uh, uh, peer workers. Uh, and so all the uh, usual professions for 135,000 inhabitants and in Bremen it's uh, 500 whole time equivalents uh, for uh, 570,000 uh, uh, inhabitants. So uh, you could say uh, uh, roughly um, uh, one worker for uh, 1,000 inhabitants. And is that mm -hmm. sufficient, Martin? Is that would? I actually, I, I actually think it is. Uh, uh, you just have to make sure that uh, the uh, you don't have uh, sixty percent of them working in in hospital settings. And um, mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, in Trieste, the ratio, the ratio between community and hospital work is uh, four to one. People may correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's 20% of the staff who are still working uh, um, in a hospital setting and the other 80% work in the community. And uh, so uh, uh, that's the main thing for uh, the rich countries. Mm -hmm. And we don't have data like that yet here in, in Toronto or in Ontario to really be able to name it that way, although I know our uh, health systems would love us to get there. We're not there yet. Um, I think that uh, I can give you just to give you a sense of here how it works. You know, we go out um, on, a, on a crisis call. There's just two people who go out to that call and they're, they work in a pair. And um, and then we have um, two people who are in the, the, the house uh, supporting um, about 10 people, uh, typically two, two to 10 people um, if the if people are on site. So it's um, it's not as many as you think. And then we have our crisis line on top of that. So the teams work, they're not so divided out. They do all aspects of the job, but typically a team would be five to six people um, per, per, per shift to, to offer telephone, mobile, and, and uh, crisis day support. I'm just going to jump to Michelle just on the, the question of resourcing and staffing uh, to, to bring a bit of the WHO perspective. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. I mean, Renato, my dear colleague, has raised an important point. And in many countries where who we were supporting, there's just a dire lack of human resources. And so you really do have dilemmas about can you offer a service with no human resources? And I think um, the answer is no. I mean, I think governments have to commit to putting in the human and financial resources into, in order to have a viable service. Uh, does it really make sense to have a hospital-based service where you don't have any staff and instead people get uh, restrained and locked up and restricted? So, you know, it, it even comes down to some questions about should you even have that service? Are you doing more harm than good um, with your approach to people in a service with no resources um, when people, the staff, resorts to coercive measures? So I think these are all valid questions. And I think there are different strategies in different countries as well, because I think, you know, more investment in working and supporting with families, you know, as well. So, and I think countries need to look at um, different creative solutions to those dilemmas. Great, thank you. I have a hand uh, from, is it Philane? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm from the Philippines and um, I'm actually a doctor who has a bipolar disorder. And um, I was recently admitted for a manic episode with psychotic features and I've experienced some sort of I, I'm not I can't say for sure if it's coercion but you know um being in the medical field and expressing my autonomy in uh in a in a psychiatric emergency it feels like um 
um, sometimes um, it's sometimes when you encounter people with mental health issues, some part of their autonomy is taken away from them. And mm -hmm. I experienced being coerced, <laughs> not really coerced, but being pressured to take medication that I wasn't sure I needed. And so um, this is some conversation that needs to happen in the spheres of mental health support because um, um, sometimes we, we don't believe that these patients are as sick as they can be or the medicine is, or some type of medication, especially since most of the psychiatric drugs are well studied, um, they're not as helpful as they could be. So I appreciate that we have this conversation on coercion and um, it's something that needs to be like the, the type of autonomy and self-worth that patients have, it's sometimes not um, brought into the conversation. So thank you for this. Um, thank, you. Session. thank you so much for your comments. Really appreciate uh, sharing your, your story and your experience. I'm going to jump to a question in the chat before we go to the next raised hand. This is a really sort of relevant question that Jonathan Mora posed about colleagues in Latin America. So the question really is that overcoming conventional psychosocial support and intervention is difficult to do without the support of the state, um, especially around community mental health models. So there may be devices or spaces within communities to support people, um, again, healing in their natural community, but there isn't support from the government or there isn't support for policy change or resource allocation. So are there any lessons from Europe or North America that can be transferred or, or generalized or useful around state support and advocacy uh, for colleagues in Latin America and other places in the world? I imagine both both of your cases, you had to kind of lobby and advocate with government and, and state partners. I, I mean, there certainly remain funding issues associated with that for us here, even though we, we look like it's all figured out, there's lots of factors at play that, that um, you know, are the barriers that we face in terms of delivering these kinds of services, including, you know, a real you know, divergence in what's paid within an institutional environment, what's paid, just paying your workers, you know, what's paid in, in, in a community environment. Um, there's, there's just so many factors at play here that, that um, you know, make, make it difficult. One of the things, though, to go back to a question earlier, not, not in relationship to this one, but, you know, talking about that whole idea of severe mental health issues like it, it, the whole paradigm we have to really think differently about what that even means what are we talking about when we say that um you know because is it by diagnosis is it by behavior is it like what are we talking about when we we say that and how do we shift to the way we think about that and understand what are the options to help people uh depending on what it is they're going through and um, the previous person to to this question was talking about not really feeling like the options were very varied. You know, it was given a, a medication and that was all and, and not really feeling like they had choice necessarily and not even sure if that was going to work for them. This is this is a, a full shift on how we think about mental health that needs to happen. So the and I'm bringing a whole bunch of questions together. So I, and I hope I'm, I'm not confusing everybody. But the, the bottom line is like, can you do something different in your community without everything changing? I would say yes, that you can. I mean, you know, Gershwin Center was not connected to hospitals or police or municipal services for, for 30 years, but yet people voted with their feet about where they went when they were in a crisis. And we would see tens of thousands of people every year coming through our door as an option that wasn't well coordinated. Um, is it going to be stronger when it is well coordinated? Yes, I do think it is. And so, you know, most recently we've connected to municipal services. So someone can call 911 or 211, which is a uh, access line for social services and, and health services in Toronto and get diverted to a mental health crisis response. That's making our model stronger, but it doesn't mean you can't start something where it is because people need options and they're searching for options. 
And one of the criticisms we get so often is people don't know where to go. But when you're searching, you're going to find things. So if you do have something that develops in your community, um, more choice versus no choice um, is, is always going to be the better option. And you have to start somewhere. So not a simple answer and not a simple solution, but uh, but we need to start changing the way we think about things in, in, in terms of mental health. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I just wanted to throw this in. I, I, I don't know if this will sort of fit in, but from just my humble experience, uh, having community services where people are actually familiar with someone who may not work in their agency or their organization can then refer maybe their clients or people they're working with to, you know, they may know a worker from another agency that that can help with some aspect of what their client or their uh, person that they're supporting. Um, and and that, that sort of conversation between uh, local agencies, uh, your family doctor, I, I have to say for, for me, I have been very fortunate to have an amazing family doctor for a few decades before he retired and he was he he was a very active part of my overall health so not just physically and for him to uh to be able to to then refer me or you know as they say hook me up with someone in the community and then someone there uh that i see um you know you might see a pamphlet or in your discussions and working with, with a worker, they may suggest, have you looked into this program? And so it just in, in a variety of ways, you can find yourself learning about things in your community that you didn't know, but it's all, it, it's almost like this internal, this, this local network. Um, and I, 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 I like that. I, I, I've come to appreciate it even more so now that I can see both sides. I've, you know, I, I use, I use the services, and I also help contribute and provide services. So uh, that, uh, that can be done with all, without a lot of bureaucracy. Um, I don't know if that helps. But, yeah. yeah, that's great. We'll go to Susan Hardy next, who's raised their hand. Hi. Um, yeah, I come from Canada. I'm located in Ottawa right now. Um, but I saw the question about scaling up something similar to Gerstein. And I guess, um, you know, as an advocate 30 years ago, I had the privilege to go to Gerstein and they actually freely shared their proposal. And I sat on a local committee and we actually did needs assessment and a peer support crisis center like the Gerstein was actually number one on our regional process. Um, so we thought we were gonna actually be able to actualize it in our community, but part of it was that we didn't have the, the committee that we were part of, the hospital didn't want that. Mm -hmm. And so, they actually went to the government and that committee was deconstructed. Like yeah. it was just obliterated. And I was just like, oh my gosh, we worked so hard to get the priority item. And there was this political piece that we didn't have. So then the notion of solidarity and knowledge sharing and people who are really dedicated to making this happen really comes to mind. I went back to school thinking I needed to learn more. And, um, then I got hired by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. I was able to write the policy, the first strategy for Canada with an incredible team. And in that, initially we proposed elimination of seclusion and restraint. And what was really important was there was a policy document that talked about the training of staff, um, about different options. Um, the, and it wasn't just training and stuff. They, they needed to know a different way of being, but their managers needed to actually support that. And then also the people with lived experience and their families of choice or families with them um, needed to understand they could be expecting something different. Um, but 
I guess the only place I actually saw it be realized was in not in the mental health sector, but in the senior sector, my old boss took that document and they actually tracked the use of psychotropic drugs um, with a uh, senior population. And they were actually able to use the practices to decrease the use of psychotropic uh, drugs as a chemical restraints. And um, they show it was possible. And I think other people have, alluded to, um, you know, like in Canada, we still talk about continuum of care, which I think is a real problem. Um, because if your focus is on the continuum, you still have people and you never realize the continuum, your money gets wasted there and you need to get the money to the people and the communities. Um, and like our community, um, resources and supports that were really grounded in need have been defunded. And so we have people going through hospitals when the hospitals are saying this is not the appropriate place. And we as advocates work to say they need to be going to a different place, like where it's less stimulating, quiet rooms. And so over three decades, we've worked so hard, but it's like it's fragmented little opportunities here and there. So for me, it's kind of like, how might we share what we've tried, what worked? How do we have political access? Because there's staff turnover, but I can tell you at a, at a political decision making, there's significant turnover of ministers. And every time they come in, the first thing they think of is a medical model. <laughs> And it's like we're starting from square one. They don't have access to the best evidence to start to inform the decision making, to talk to them about something like Gerstein or the work in Germany. So I just, sorry, there's not a question, but I'm kind of like, how do we connect and share so that we could support each other to be more impactful, maybe? Thank you. But yeah, so this isn't there's totally always. Related. There's always oh. road bumps, right? but there's there's a really yeah. important role for telling the story of how we made it through. Go ahead, Susan. Yeah, I mean, so many things stood out for me, Susan. Obviously, it's in the context of Canada, and and, and I know Ottawa and what happened there. Um, but so many things stood out for me in that. And one at the very beginning, your comment was that um, sometimes you don't have the institutional support where the power is held. Uh, to support the work to go forward, and it can be very derailed. And uh, we saw that uh, and most recently, too, in the latest iteration of trying to develop um, diversion from 911 calls to community-based services um, in other parts of Canada as well. And in Ottawa in particular, what happened was police were part of the, part of the response, which they need to be, but they also were trying to lead the response, and it, it, it put things back a, a bit. They, were, they, they didn't make the room for the community to really... Um, be able to develop the model the way they wanted. So even though our model started in Toronto at the same time as Ottawa, Ottawa's not there yet because of the collaboration. So the collaboration is so important and the institutional support and, and the readiness of every institution is not exactly the same in terms of for change. So that, that can be really problematic as you're trying to come together. And so it takes a lot of relationship building and sharing and all of that to, ma to make that happen. But the other part is that we have... Um, you know, a huge movement to do evidence-based care, you know, to make sure we're talking about evidence-based care, which is, of course, really important. And part of what we're actually doing today is sharing that evidence with each other so that people can see. But I think oftentimes, unfortunately, evidence-based care is also about preserving the status quo, because what is done is what gets studied, and then we just study it, and it goes over and over, and we end up with this big body of evidence that supports the status quo as opposed to the changes that we need to see. So I'd like to just invite people to think about that um, as we're talking about that, thinking broad, more broadly from evidence-based approach and, and starting to do some other things. And it's very difficult to get that understood and heard and in a place that people can understand that it works, but we really need to move in that direction, and we need our institutional partners to support that and not to dominate um, and push those kinds of um, newer alternatives and options down. And Martin, how have you navigated obstacles like that in terms of, you know, people that might be champions moving on or um, uh, decision makers getting in the way of, of the work that you want to advance? 
Well, you build alliances with, with those who are willing uh, to build alliances. And, um, and fortunately, that was, uh, the health insurance companies were quite positive about this, uh, which was initially a little bit surprising. And yeah. then, and then the users uh, groups uh, were extremely helpful, and then, uh, and then, well, you just need to tell a positive story from the beginning. It will not pan out as positive in the first years as as you said it it would, but uh, you need to start something and then mitigate the crisis that are that will be happening anyway. So we're getting close to one dialogue we really need to work against is this idea of, of safety that there's somehow that we are posing a lack of safety for people in our communities by not dealing with things. And I think that our, our understanding around safety needs to be widened and think about how many people we did a recent uh, poll of, of folks who were going to be part of a study here to, to try and get people to participate in um, a study that looked at coercion in care. And we put it at ask out to people and we were stunned. It was so many people had experienced coercion in their in their healthcare journey for mental health that it was it was just not a very difficult recruitment at all. And then what I don't know why we were stunned because we know that, but it was really absolutely absolutely shocking. So um we really need to change we, we have to work hard in our communities to change that dialogue um, and that narrative around mental health. It's it's a big barrier. And so you'll see politicians using that to get community to get to get uh, support in their communities because uh, and then we perpetuate this on and on and we we need to do a better job of, of really getting communities to really understand because there's a lot of people who aren't safe and i'll tell you the biggest number of those living with mental health and substance use needs they are they, they they are the most impacted about not being safe in our communities the way they exist right now thank you thank you for that so we're really close to ending um, not enough time for more questions, but I want to try to synthesize some of the things that we've heard to really highlight, just jumping off from the, the point that you made, Susan, about safety. Safety is mutual, right? We all know that the safest environments for, for people who work in them are the safest environments for the people that we serve. So we have to really disrupt that narrative. But essentially, what this work requires of us is a lot. There's a, a huge amount of emotional, cognitive labor that's engaged when you try to swim upstream against the norm. And so I think it's also really important to emphasize self-compassion for all of us doing the work um, and, and support. And uh, that that's part of why I'm grateful to the WHO folks. And I'm just going to turn it over to Michelle for some closing comments before we end. Well, uh, thank you um, very much. So, you know, I think we do need to wrap up now and I know various people have to leave. So um, first of all, just a huge thanks to Javid, Susan, Kaola and Martin. Thank you so much for participating in this dialogue. Uh, also, thank you to all the people online who've been, who also participating and bringing your questions and ideas. Uh, just a very brief reminder, please check all the resources in the chat, do the quality rights e-training because we think you'll learn a lot um, just from doing that. And um, also my last comment is a reminder about our next webinar, which is going to be on crisis de-escalation, 26th of April from 12.30 to 2 o'clock. Uh, CET. So we'll be sending out some information about that. And I hope you've enjoyed everything and that you'll want to turn up to this next webinar. Big thanks to everyone again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.